Welcome to Planet Rack on Tour, where we who tell stories rule this world. I'm your host, Yug Nasty, and I will be your guide into our world that's filled with sights and sounds, both wonderful and frightening. Finding the right person for you can be a difficult thing. We've all experienced the good and the bad. Once in a while, the universe provides you with your perfect match. Here is 84% compatible by returning author, Jared K. Anderson. This is 84% compatible by Jared K. Anderson. The gap between Ted's front teeth opened onto a solar system buzzing with civilizations of light and power. Every once in a while, it would glint and draw the eye of Becky Cooley, the shy paralegal with the 84% compatibility rating from the dating site. Ted found that trying to laugh behind his hands was kind of awkward. Trying to tilt his head down while he spoke was awkward, too. He'd lost dates to awkwardness and to the bushy mustache he had used to curtain his upper lip for a few weeks in June. So Ted tried to talk with Becky head on and her inevitable questions followed. Questions about the twinkle between his teeth, the sense of life and hope and industry in it. Ted felt his cheeks and ears getting hot, but he did his best not to sound embarrassed. He answered Becky's questions. He even did his best to answer the questions she would think of later. He said, it's a solar system. It's been there ever since my adult teeth came in. I don't know if it's a doorway or if the whole system is actually there in my mouth. I don't know if it will live on after I die. I'm not sure if the people there know about me or have ever tried to communicate. And yes, the government knows all about it. Becky went still and Ted worried that it might have been rude of him to anticipate her future questions. The specter of awkwardness grew like an afternoon shadow. Becky didn't quite smile as she pushed her long brown hair behind her left ear and tilted her head. There, above her little gold earring, nestled in the folds of her ear, Ted could just see a bluish glow. And in that glow was somehow the force of gravity held in balance amongst the waltz of stars and planets and the countless souls that spun along with them. Ted smiled. He smiled with the light of 300 billion stars. Becky smiled back. The End We all love a story with a happy ending, but I would rather something a little more darker. <laughs> How twisted am I? Well, it is Halloween after all. If we had the power of life and death in our hands, what would we do with it? Our next story is one man's quest to that answer. Here is Endgame by Thomas Canfield. End game by Thomas Canfield. Death ensues within 30 seconds. The voice conveying this warning was calm, restrained, devoid of any sense of urgency. It was matter of fact, but I was gripped by the same surge of adrenaline as I always was. 30 seconds. It was the barest fraction of an instant. It was the mere flicker of an eyelid. And it was a lifetime. It was all of eternity. Either perspective was equally valid. The one constant that always catapulted to the fore was the blistering intensity, a dropping away of all other cares and concerns. The world was reduced to a single overriding imperative. Disarm the mechanism. Short circuit the equation. I waited, hunched forward, 
tense and expectant. What followed was this incredible moment of lag, an interval of emptiness that seemed to extend out into infinity. And then... 29, 28, 27. The same calm, unhurried tone, a female voice pitched low with a certain husky intimacy to it as though the approaching specter of death were a game of seduction, a courtship that led to but one inevitable conclusion. I shut the machine down, stared at it with glazed, empty eyes. The designers had given the device an imposing, physically intimidating appearance. It bristled with switches and dials, featured sleek silver and black hard alloy casing. Its appearance played to one's own inner conception of death. Blunt, hard-nosed, unforgiving. It was disconcerting to realize that even death could be manipulated in such a fashion. Even death was subject to such superficial ploys. I unplugged the machine, hid it away at the back of the closet. Some people displayed the unit quite openly, setting it out upon a table as they might any other piece of bric-a-brac. I found such behavior incomprehensible. To face such temptation every day, to deny and overcome it, asked and demanded too much of any man. In the closet, at least, I could pretend that the device didn't exist even if the pretense was not wholly satisfactory or convincing. Death ensues within 20 seconds. The pause again, hanging over the edge of the precipice. It was an exhilarating moment, a rush unlike any other. And then... 19, 18, 17. I terminated the count at 13, sat sweated to the chair, Death was parked right in front of me. A malignant viper, silver and black. I stared at it, fascinated. Was the device really an accurate representation of death? Form followed function, or so it was said. But was this not rather one more interim step, one more way station, part of a process that would lead to death but that would reveal itself only in the final shattering instant? A pleasant lassitude settled over me. I felt drowsy and spent. I ran my fingertips over my skin with a slow, sensual movement, gratified to find myself alive. Still, something worried at my mind. I detected a subtle shift in the voice as it counted down the seconds. The change was unexpected and unnerving. The voice had become marked by a tremulous quality, an underlying strain of emotion. It was too indistinct and undeveloped for me to define, however. For that, I would have to wait, would have to push closer to the end game. Death ensues within 10 seconds. The pause, stretching out to eternity, was taut as piano wire. Then... Nine, eight, Seven. I had tried to stay away, had endeavored to avoid the machine, but I had come back, as I always did, helpless to deny it. I had become more and more intrigued by a metaphysical conundrum no one had yet succeeded in resolving. Did a man hear the zero? That is, zero marked the point of termination, the final, irrevocable end of everything. But did a man hear it? Did it register upon his consciousness? He heard the one hanging out over the abyss, but the zero. Zero and death would seem to be simultaneous, effectively canceling each other out. No one knew, not even those who had designed the unit, whether the zero manifested itself in a manner that could be comprehended and recognized or whether it was lost, swallowed, annihilated in the spiraling descent into death. The only way to find out was to follow the string to the very end. Four. Four. 
three. There was still time to bail in the process, and for a fleeting instant, I considered it. I might have acted had it not been for the voice. As the count approached nearer to the end, the underlying dynamics changed. The voice assumed a more emphatic cast, abandoning the aura of carefully modulated neutrality, substituting in its place what exactly? Shades of meaning resided in the tone that an entire lifetime might prove insufficient to decipher. Was the acid trill that now laced the consonants a warning, a, a plea to pull back before it was too late? Had the programmers installed a speed bump to deter those who embraced their product with too much enthusiasm and with too little regard for the consequences? Yet the voice did not support such an interpretation. And then I had it, right on the cusp of the word one. The pitch and cadence had become infused with something unexpected. Something I had failed to recognize precisely because I had not been looking for it. It was a blend of emotion that swamped any innate sense of caution which remained that instilled in me a sense of triumph and vindication. It was envy, pure and simple. It was envy. I heard the one, stared spellbound into a dazzling vortex of silver and black. It receded into a distance so remote so as to almost approach its own point of origin and so come full circle again. I thought that I heard the zero and reached out to embrace it, only to find that it had vanished, had never, in fact, existed at all. The End I would like to take this time out and thank everyone who has been supporting the Planet Record Tour podcast on social media, especially YouTube. Make sure to sub to us at youtube.com forward slash planet tour. It's been said some of the best stories come from old men in taverns. After tonight's last story, we might have to agree. Here is Great White Ship by Lou Antonelli. Great White Ship by Lou Antonelli. I was poking at my drink with a swizzle stick killing time waiting for my connecting flight. The American Airlines Admirals Club was nearly empty. I stared at the DFW airway and watched the flights taking off and landing. I lost interest in the TV a long time ago. An old man was cleaning the table next to me. He'd stopped and stared up at the TV screen in the corner of the room. I once saw a ship just like that. His tone caught my attention, and I looked over. There was a CNN science report on about building airships in the future with futuristic ultralight materials. It showed a large white prototype of a dirigible designed to be used as a cargo hauler. I smiled. Hold on there, old man, that's only a model. There hasn't been anything like that in the sky since the Hindenburg blew up. You're not old enough to have seen the Hindenburg. He looked down, and a crooked smile crossed his face. I saw it in Tyler, Texas in 1974. It was from another world. The government swore us to secrecy. I think I'm a pretty good judge of character. I could tell he wasn't kidding or crazy. His eyes were bright and he seemed very rational. I looked at my watch. I got at least a half an hour until my flight arrives. You got my interest. At that point, I tossed a 50 on the tabletop. Go get us two drinks and come back here. Sit just for a few minutes and keep the change. I pushed the bill toward him. You sound like you have an interesting story to tell. He smiled as he palmed the 50. He went over to the bar, spoke to the bartender, pointing at me. The bartender nodded and he came back with another Chivas and Coke for me and a sea breeze for himself. He sat down, took a long sip, sighed, 
and then began. I was an Air Force supply sergeant in Vietnam. Now, when I got back, I picked up work with American Airlines. I was offered a job in Tyler. See, I was from East Texas, so that sounded like a great idea to me. I was assigned to the ground crew at Tyler Pounds Airport. Uh, they had just started a commuter service between Tyler and Dallas. I've heard of Tyler. Never been there. How big is it? Biggest city in East Texas, maybe 100,000 people these days. But back then, it was closer to 60,000. You ever been to East Texas? You ever been in an East Texas thunderstorm? No. It's like God dumps a big tin bucket of water on top of your head. Then drops a bucket over your head, and then he pounds on the bucket. Now, this all happened in April 1974. Man, I remember the date well. April 3rd, 1974. The weather was horrendous all across the country that day. Dozens of tornadoes were dropping from the sky in the north and to the east of us, places like Indiana, Alabama. We were all following the weather reports, and by mid-afternoon, American had canceled flights for the rest of the day as some really nasty storms began to form right around us. Now, everyone else had gone home, but I stayed behind to catch up on reading a, a repair manual. At 6 p.m., everything turned completely black in the east. Wind picked up like the devil, and a minute later, my radio began to squawk. I'll never forget it. American Airlines LTA Flight 5980 calling Tyler Pounds. Request permission for emergency landing. LTA? Yeah, I was puzzled too. Billy Mack, the controller, was still in the tower, and he came on. He said they weren't listed in American Airlines flight schedule for that day. The voice shouted back on the radio, Damn it, I have a wall cloud ramming me up the ass, and I'm barely keeping control. Get your ground crew out and get ready for lines. Pronto! Now, I had no idea what this guy was talking about. But as for ground crew, well, I was it right then. I hung the radio on my belt and ran outside. I was looking towards the storm. I heard the radio again. It was Billy this time. We have no record of your flight number, he said. Guy says, we're an H-Class LTA Superliner, Flight 5980, New Orleans to Dallas, requesting permission to land on your runway AZ-40. Now, you could practically hear a pin drop on the radio. Finally, Billy Mack came on and said, really slow. You're cleared for landing. There's nothing on the runway. Lights are on. Good luck. My channel beat Pete. What the fuck is out there? There's some damn thing on the radar the size of an aircraft carrier. Now, I told him I have no idea. It hadn't broken through the wall cloud yet. I'm still looking. The air to tower channel lit up again. We could use a few people on the ground. We have 20 lines. We don't need a mast. We have an auto anchor. Billy Mac raised his voice. 20 lines of what? What the hell are you talking about? 20 mooring lines, you putts, the pilot said. This is an airship. LTA, lighter than air. What the hell's wrong with you? I clicked on my radio. Something is just breaking through the clouds. Hold on. Then I saw it. Oh, my God, was all I could mutter. It was like a giant ocean liner parting the clouds, only this was 500 feet above the ground and lumbering straight towards the main runway. A long, pale cylinder coming at us like the finger of God himself. You see that, Billy? I asked. "Uh Uh-huh, he drawled. It would have been funny if it hadn't been so unreal. Billy's voice came back to the radio. We're not rated to handle craft like yours. We don't have the ground crew, but you're welcome to make an unassisted landing. 
about that point, the pilot came back with a series of uh, rather unkind language, which clearly showed he'd been in the Air Force, too. Finally concluding any fucking port in the storm, I guess. Now, I could hear the engines, and they were so loud, you know, like aircraft engines, but moving slowly. It sounded like God was clearing his throat. Well, what happened next? Thankfully, we were in the lull in front of the storm at that point, and the wind was almost calm as the giant airship lowered its nose down and dove toward the tarmac. Man, I'd never seen anything like this in my life. It was amazing. The runway was about 6,000 feet long, and I could see as it floated over the airship, it had to be at least 1,000 feet long itself. It was shiny white, almost reflected. You could clearly see the American Airlines logo, the two A's with the eagle toward the front, and again on the tail fins. There was a name along the side. I didn't recognize it. I guess it was the name of the ship. It said the William Lemke. This giant thing lowered toward the runway. And man, I I just had to stand there with my jaw dropped open. Right when it looked like it was going to impact, the nose rose up and the whole ship began to straighten out. It leveled off and water began to pour out of its underside as it dumped its ballast. It continued forward, and then the wheel under the gondola screeched as it made contact. Oh, that must have been something. Oh, yeah, it was. As the back part of the ship slowly settled down, cables fell from its side. They dragged on the ground, and the anchors caught. Then the back wheels made contact. The ship bounced one more time and stuck. I looked and realized a man had jumped out of the gondola, which was still moving, by the way, and rolled onto the tarmac. He picked himself up quickly and he ran over to me. He asked me, how many people do you have in your ground crew? He was wearing coveralls like me. I told him, I'm it. Everybody else was sent home. He cursed and then he looked back toward the ship. Well, I think we lucked out. It's almost calm right this minute. We had a smooth landing. I think we can handle it from this point. Now, I could see men pouring out of the undercarriage, running out and securing the cables on the ground on either side of the runway with heavy stakes. A loud mechanical whining began. Excellent. That's the auto anchor kicking in, said the engineer. Hopefully, we can ride out the storm here. The co-pilot had walked over. We have 126 passengers and crew to wait out the storm in your terminal. Where's it at? I pointed over to it. Now, our terminal was barely the size of of a McDonald's. His eyes widened. It'll have to do. He gestured toward the other crew members who were closer to the airship and started directing the people who were coming out. They ran toward the terminal, shielding themselves as rain began to pelt. The storm was picking up again as that greenish-black wall cloud came toward us. The old man had drained his drink. I hadn't touched mine. He rubbed his forehead and seemed to be in some pain. Hey, listen, old fella, stay put. I'll go get us another round. The bartender nodded to me as I walked over to the bar. He said, you're being nice to old Pete. That's good for you. I said, well, he's got an interesting story. About the great white ship, he said, yep. He said, yeah, I heard it once. He doesn't tell many people. You're the first passenger he's talked to about it. I said, well, I guess I just got that kind of face. I went back and put the drink in front of the old man. Thank you. He thanked me very seriously and went right back into his story. Now, Billy, uh, Billy Mac was uh, still upstairs in the control tower. The only other people there, a janitor and a security guard, were with me in the, you know, our, our small terminal when the airship pilot walked up. He was a young fella, very clean cut, and he smelled of shaving cream and cologne. The name on his badge said Will Banks. I'll never forget that. Who's in charge here, he asked, getting kind of loud with us. 
I told him I am, I guess. The crew went home after the remaining flights were canceled. The wind and rain were now pounding the small building and shaking the windows. At that point, the pilot's attitude seemed to soften a bit. He said, thank you for the hospitality. I'm sorry if I sounded rude. Uh, We're all pretty rattled here, you know. I looked out the window to see the airship being buffeted by the storm. As dark as it was outside, you could still see the enormous white shape through the rain. Pilot walked over. She'll be okay. With all those cables stalked, and we have an auto anchor running. It looks like it's the size of the Hindenburg, I told him. Well, it's on a a Hindenburg 4 frame, 400 feet longer, though. Still considered a Hindenburg class, though. I guess you guys don't have airship service here. Nearest LTA aerodrome must be what, uh, Shreveport? Now, at this point, the co-pilot had walked up. Baton Rouge, he said. President Long, uh, uh, President Long Memorial Aerodrome. <clears throat> Pilot looked over and smiled. Never flew there. I've been back up in the New Orleans to Dallas route since I got back from flying in Czechoslovakia. Billy Mack, in the meantime, had snuck up behind us. President Long, he says. Uh, Huey P. Long was never president. The pilot and co-pilot looked at each other. We were practically in Louisiana, said the pilot with a laugh. That's kind of blasphemy, don't you think? Your daddy must have voted for Roosevelt. At that point, Billy's eyes narrowed. Yeah, actually he did. In 32, and in 36, and in 40, and 44, and he would have kept voting for him for president, but he died on us. The co-pilot began to sputter. Now, now wait, Huey P. Long was president until, and I, at that point, I held my hand up and I interrupted. Something told me to ask a question. <sighs> okay, probably going to regret this. But I I pointed at the pilot and I said, who's the president of the United States right now? That's a stupid question, he said. George Wallace is, of course. Now, Billy Mack's jaw dropped and I nudged him in the ribs and I said, "Uh, you better call Barksdale. Barksdale was a strategic air command base during the Cold War, wasn't it? (sighs) Yep. The old man was halfway through his second drink. And Billy Mack called him. I asked the security guard to unplug the TV, and the janitor disconnected the phone switch box. I figured people would eventually start trying to call home. We told them phone service was knocked out by the storm. (sighs) Barksdale was just outside Shreveport. Now, they're only about 100 miles away from us. There were uh, strategic air command officers there by 8 p.m. They grabbed the pilot the co-pilot, other crew members, and they took them to a private office. By 9.30, two big buses had pulled up outside. From what I could overhear, they told the passengers that the weather was too threatening to let them take off again and that they were going to take them to Dallas by interstate. Now, after the buses left, some guy in a suit wearing dark glasses, inside, mind you, in a storm, with some Air Force officers standing behind him, took the four of us, me, Billy Mack, the guard, and the janitor, into an office, and he looked at us and said, I don't know what you know or what you heard, but I strongly suggest for your own good that you forget it all. There are basically words to that effect. Uh, Billy Mack asked what the hell was going on. The suit pointed a finger at his chest and said, National Security, none of your business. Keep quiet, he said, going on and on and poking Billy's chest at every period and every comma. He said they had an explanation for everything that happened. And if we ever raise the subject, well, you get it. It all sounded pretty ominous. I bet you all kept your mouth shut then. Well, we were all reassigned or transferred to different places by American. Uh, I've been at DFW ever since, as a matter of fact. Worked on the ground crew for 30 years until my knees wore out. Now I work here, piling up seniority for my retirement. I don't even know what happened to the others. 
Well, what happened to the airship? Didn't people ask about it? The airport was very isolated, miles outside of the city. I guess no one saw it land during the storm, and it was gone by dawn's early light. I don't know. How can you make something that big disappear overnight? It wasn't there the next morning. Now, whether it was flown out or taken apart or went through a black hole again, I don't know. Black hole again? I pushed my drink toward him. What do you mean again? Hmm. Remember what I said about East Texas thunderstorms? I asked the pilot what had happened up there, you know, before the uh, Barksdale people arrived. He said that when they got caught in the storm, he started looking desperately for a gap in the clouds to fly through. The lightning was spectacular, he said, and the air was full of ozone. After one incredible electric barrage, he spotted a dark spot straight ahead. Now, he assumed that it was clear air, but it wasn't. It was more turbulent than ever, and their instruments just went haywire. But he had no choice. He just gunned the engines full throttle, and, and, and he pushed through. And it seemed to work, and they found themselves just ahead of the wall cloud and on our beacon. That's when they radioed us. They had lost contact with Shreveport anyway. But something was different? Yeah. He didn't have much time to talk. But he said Huey Long was never assassinated and that he beat Roosevelt for president in 36. Long was less hostile to Germany than Roosevelt would have been. And the U.S. let Germany have helium. So the Hindenburg never blew up. Now that's why airships are still being used wherever they came from. Well, well, what happened in World War II then? The U.S. didn't declare war on Germany. It stayed neutral and fought Japan instead. But because uh, we never invaded Europe, the Russians eventually took it over, and when they beat Germany after 10 years of war, they made the Cold War a whole lot worse. After Long died, Joe McCarthy became president, then Wallace replaced him. Actually, it really wasn't a Cold War, I'd say. Uh, the Russians in the U.S. had been fighting in a number of places for years. The pilot had just learned to fly fighting the Reds in Czechoslovakia. Hmm. There must have been a lot of nuclear attacks. Things must have been really bad. And that's the funny thing. The pilot had never heard of an atomic bomb. He finished off my drink. I grabbed his wrist to keep him from getting up from the table. Why are you telling me this? Uh, I need to get back to work. I don't know. I guess I'm so old now I don't care anymore. I've only told a few people, and really only in the past two or three years. And only when I'm drunk. Con Dios, amigo. I went to wave, saw my watch on my wrist, and realized it was time for my flight. I couldn't afford to miss my connection because of some bizarre tale told by a drunk old man, so I grabbed my carry-on and shot through the door. I was in first class, so while I sat there, trying to relax and maybe forget the story that I'd been told, I could hear the cockpit chatter. Pilot was a white-haired old guy. I overheard him saying he was looking forward to his retirement. He said, I've been flying these birds for American Airlines since I got back from Nahum. I'm ready to relax and kick back. A few minutes later, he stood in the entrance to the cabin and looked over the interior. I saw the name on his badge. Will Banks. After a moment of shock, I jumped up and realized he was turning away. Hey, hey Captain, I gestured to him. Yes, sir, he said, perhaps a little irritated as well as puzzled. I grabbed the edge of the luggage rack to steady myself. I looked him in the eye and asked quietly, Have you ever dreamed you were the pilot of a great white airship? You could see the universe in his eyes. Who are you, he asked to know my innermost dream. 
Never even told my wife. No one you've ever met before, I said, but I think we have a mutual friend. After we take off and you're on autopilot, we need to talk. He looked at me, amazed. I said, I want to tell you a story. The end. Well, there you go. Another trip to Planet Rack on tour. On behalf of myself and our two fine Rack on tours, Papa Dave and Bobby Anthem, we would like to thank you for listening once again. All of the stories presented on Planet Rack and Tour are used by permission or are in the public domain. Check out the show notes for details on the authors, their websites, and their other releases. And if you like what we are doing, please subscribe and follow us on all of our social media platforms. The links will be found in those same show notes. Much love. And thank you again for visiting the Planet Raconteur.